Welcome back to Gran Hagramito and the Pedroche Valley of Andalusia, Spain. Today's video is different as I will explain a major change in direction. So, hello guys. This is a somewhat special video because usually I don't put myself in front of the camera, but for the occasion I think it makes sense to explain a few things. So as the title already said, we are going to remove our kettle. And it's not that we're getting out of this because it's not working or something like that. It's just a temporary step and we will not remove them all together in just one go. We start with those six that have been um, deemed tuberculosis positive. It is very likely that we will learn after a while that they were false positives, at least some of them, but you never know. And that is one of the factors that led to the decision. The other is, and that is probably more important, we have learned that cattle also they provide the benefits that we expected by means of their manure and their urine that they spread all over the place. Um, they have contributed and the soil has become a little bit better, but their management is a challenge. And because their management is a challenge, we looked left and right and uh, looked at different other species which is also connected to our search or our quest for a net zero on the economic side. Um, what else we can do? So, in a nutshell, the idea is to remove the cattle and bring in donkeys, together with the horses that we have, and poultry. Because for poultry there is a local market, while for the meat from bovines, there isn't. Plus the fact that we cannot slaughter on site due to existing laws, um, it's a big problem, it's a big challenge. So there are a lot of downsides and the only positive thing about cattle is that they yeah, shit <laughs> and they urinate and that contributes. But other species provide a different substance. And that different substance makes it uh, more interesting. Plus, their management is a lot easier. So, I will give you a summary and then I will venture into different takes. I intend to do this at different places here on the property, um, go into more detail. So, here is the very short list of things. So, cattle management is a hassle, because even if they are trained to the electric fence, they do challenge it, while other species don't. So, a cow sees something that is greener on the other side and if the fence is not high powered and also sturdy, so that means a lot of fence posts to, in order to maintain the wires tensioned, the cow will try to get to the other side because the grass is always greener on the other side. In comparison, a donkey or a horse will not do that. They see a single wire and that is enough. They will not try to get to the other side, most of them. So that makes it easier. And now if you compare the manure, horse manure is a lot more nutritious for the soil, and that is our main subject and concern, than a cow patty. Cow patties are great, but you need to have a lot of them. And of course all the other factors then play also into, come into play. So a lot of people are using donkeys just to have some fertilizer on site. So that tells a story. So the donkey can definitely replace the cow. Now of course donkey and horse is pretty much the same, but donkeys are much easier to acquire because a horse is a valuable thing and uh, people want to ride it and all this, while a donkey has lost its value because we have cars and all the other things. Plus, here in Andalusia, there is a type of donkey called the Asno Andalus. And that one is kind of 
at the, yeah, uh, the risk of extinction. Not the donkey per se, but this special type of donkey. So it would be a nice thing to keep them around. And we are in a position that we can actually do this. So we want to acquire a few donkeys. Of course, nobody wants to eat a horse or a donkey, at least not in our situation. In Mongolia, that is different. So they are definitely not a product, but donkeys have other properties. They can help us, like the mules did, with agriculture. So there's a benefit that cows in that way don't have. Next thing is um, poultry, I said. So we want to introduce different types of birds and that means chicken and there's a product the eggs and also the meat of course we don't want to go for laying hens that lay 320 eggs per year and only can sustain this for two or three years until they die because they are exhausted instead we go for a type of chicken that lays less eggs but lives a lot longer so there is this type of um, hen, Araucana, and they lay eggs that are blue and have other nutritious values. So they are a little bit um, more interesting. And here locally, and also in the rest of Spain, these eggs fetch a totally different price. So just to give a figure, 10 euros for a pack of 12 eggs, while the other ones you can get for 12 eggs for less than three euros. So there's a huge difference. So it makes even sense to ship boxes with a dozen eggs, while the other eggs, they are distributed in the supermarket and so on. And people don't value them that much like the others. And then of course there is um, chicken meat. And we figured out by asking around um, that the people here eat a lot of chicken. It's a lot cheaper than the other types of meat. They don't like cow meat, so they don't prefer this. They don't buy it. There is no local market for that. There is for the Iberico pig, but that is more for special occasions. So they eat a presa Iberica on a Sunday or in a restaurant. But when they eat at home just to um, have some food for themselves, they actually eat a lot of chicken. So there is a market. And we ask a few butchers and they sell quite a lot of chicken meat. And there is no local producer. Usually it comes from afar, might be as near as Sevilla, which is quite a distance. Think about in a truck, at least three hours. Or it comes even from other places in Spain. And we can distribute locally. People said, yeah, why not? So there would be a benefit. And then the topic of predators, of course, needs to be addressed. If we put out a few chickens, we basically put out a buffet for foxes and other predators, especially the aerial ones. Um, I can give you a list which ones are around, but they are definitely around. And the chickens that we had um, fell prey to all these predators. Unfortunately, it included in a few cases our own dogs, but um, so be it. So, chickens, you can either keep in a salatine style chicken tractor and move them every day the length of the chicken tractor, so two meters, and you move them two meters every day. And they will manure, so that is good for the soil. And also they eat the grass and some bugs that they can find, plus the supplemental feed. And in that little cage, they are protected. Nobody will be able to get to them easily, unless a fox has enough time to dig a hole or something like that. So I don't expect this, because um, we are around and we move them every day. And the laying hens, yeah, we need something like an egg mobile. And the egg mobile has um, an electric fence, an electric wire mesh around, so that they stay inside. But for the actual protection, we have a donkey around. And donkeys are territorial and they will even attack. So if there's, for example, a fox that would like to snatch a chicken, 
the donkey will definitely at attack the fox. But then there are the aerial predators, and of course the donkey is outside the electric fence. So we put a goose inside, and one goose will basically bond with the chicken and protect them. If we would put in their multiple geese, then they would form a group and not bother with the chicken anymore. So the idea is, per little group of laying hens, might be just a hundred at most, there will be one goose as a protector and outside there is the donkey. So here's the second part where I wanted to talk a little bit about the issues with cattle, those guys there. So as you can see right now, they are munching on alfalfa pellets, which is bought feed. We did not grow this. This is not fertility that stems from our land that we are trying to restore. We used money to buy this and now we are feeding them to keep them alive and well fed. So from a agricultural perspective, especially industrial agriculture, that makes sense. We feed them in order to sell them and we make some money by charging the difference basically. And I'm a little bit curious because there in the background on the neighbor's land there is a little fire. But it just started. Seems uh, something might be on purpose or not. I don't know whether someone is there. But okay, I better keep an eye on that because it might also be a developing forest fire. Okay, but um, while this develops or not, I can still continue to tell you the story. So, the issues with cattle. So the major issue is fencing. If you look there at the background, you can see our temporary fence, which is an electric one. It works, but it only works if it is well energized and of course if the animal is not eager to challenge it. That requires a lot of fence posts, so basically every four meters we should have a fence post so that we can really tension the wire and we need to have enough. So depending on the size of the animal that means four or five hot wires or else they will lower their head as they do with some brush or something else um, that they are used to because the fence is basically that and then they will try to push through it. They have no issue with thorns, they have a skin that is very thick, that is why we can make leather out of that skin and therefore um, they have a different perception of um, yeah, of, um, of this sensation. So they just push through unless the wire is hot and there is enough time between pulses. So their pain perception is different and that allows them to do that. A dog touches it and then the message has been sent. The same goes for a pig. With cattle, that is different. So fencing is one issue and we need to build a lot of very good fences in order to do some rotational grazing with them because we lack people. So I admire Greg Judy, does a wonderful job, explains a lot, but he has to help us. And I would think that they are there from sunrise to sunset. And maybe he and his wife, I don't know how they are organized, somehow cover the whole day. Plus the farms he is using, I remember he mentioned 12 of them, they are pretty large. Of course the herd is also large, but then you can probably um, strip graze a little bit, bunch them up during the day while people are there and then you just remove the wire, because he works with a single wire, and then they get to use the rest of this particular farm for the rest of the day and the next day they are somewhere else. We cannot do this. We have 45 hectares, there is a perimeter fence around it, and then we have to do some internal fencing, and either we have to be there all the time, or the animals will roam the whole place. Like it is in the whole region for everybody. So we end up with set stocking, 
And we know set starting is not the best way because they will eat everything that they can reach, that they can find. And eventually the time that is required to let the plant grow again is not observed. So we have continuous grazing at the end and that is what we don't want. So we can either employ a lot more people, which means a lot of money, and we need to find people who are willing to work during the hot part of the day, in summer especially, and in the afternoon. Now the local culture goes against this because people like to be at home for the big lunch, which is basically at four o'clock, and then they want to go out for drinks with friends and before that they need to sleep. That is how Spanish culture works and there is nothing you can do about this. So this is not an option. So the only option that we are left with is to build a lot of fences and those fences are expensive. Of course we have been doing that and I have said a few times in the past that this is a good idea and we also want to continue that for different reasons. One of them is so that we can protect whatever we plant. But this segment is about why are we removing the cattle. So they need to have this really good fencing, like the fencing that we have over there. So this kind of fencing, this takes a lot of time and also requires a lot of resources to build. So eventually the whole farm will look like that, all the 44 or the, all the 45 hectares. But it's an issue and maybe at this time it's more a hassle than a benefit. So we should always look what is a benefit considering long-term effects, but still what is a benefit right now. So fencing is a hassle, fencing is an issue, because of all these reasons. And then there's the other issue. As you can see, there is pretty much not a lot of vegetation that these boys and girls can feed on. So we are at the beginning of March, and because of all the cold and lack of rain, there is not a lot of forage. Of course, January and February, the two winter months basically, are the worst time of the year. Because grasses don't grow below 5 centigrades, and then it doesn't matter how much it rains, it's simply too cold. So there is no forage. Of course you can stockpile, but stockpile only works if you have good growth in the earlier part of the year. So that means in summer. And in summer nothing grows and in autumn it starts growing and depending on how the temperatures go it might then stop or grow slowly or as we had this time because Spain is still in a drought. Um, there is not enough water to take advantage of the temperature. So our growing actually started very very late. Certainly two months later than the years before since 2018 that we were here. So that's another issue. So we mitigate this by buying straw and the pellets that they just ate. So I'll give you a figure. Um, last year we basically bought external feed in the form of straw and pellets for a little bit more than 10,000 euros. And we have not sold any meat or anything else that comes out of this herd of cattle. So that's pretty sad. From a business perspective, um, yeah, we better declare bankrupt, yeah, bankruptcy because it's not working out. Of course, we are not in this to make money. This is, after all, for and foremost, an ecosystem restoration project. And if there is something, some surplus that we can sell, then we will do this. But if there isn't, then we are going to be patient and wait until we have achieved abundance so that we can sell the surplus but you can see the abundance it's not there it's still an uphill battle so they need to bring in so much external biomass and not to feed the soil in the first place but to feed them is another issue 
Of course, they will feed the soil. That happens because all that straw that they won't eat, this will feed the soil in the particular area. And of course, the droppings, the manure, also does the same thing. So what we have achieved so far, we have achieved thanks to them. So um, soil restoration with cattle, I am definitely convinced that this does work. But it's a question how fast it works and what the cost of it is. So like I said in the introduction, um, there might be better ways. So this is about why we are removing them. So here's the second point. So even if we were to treat them like a product, there is no market. So the situation here in Spain is um, you usually, here in this area, raise some calves until they are about nine months old or so, and then you separate them from the cows and you sell them to a feedlot, where they are fed quickly, and when they have less than two years of age, they get slaughtered and sold as meat. And the sad part of that is, not only is the meat not really good, because it's not the grass-fed type, that some of us love, but it also is bad on the economic side. So the word is that typically one is paid 600 euros per animal, and now you would have to have a lot of them in order to make ends meet. So you can easily calculate when you have a monthly cost of, let's say, 4,000 for staff and salaries for two people, and of course, you yourself also want to have a little bit, so it's probably already short. Um, so you would have to need a lot of calves on sale in order to make ends meet. So you are at a loss unless you have a lot of animals. So this is not a business. This does not work out, which is why a lot of people have been giving up and given the environmental situation, um, drought and all that, more are giving up and the land that gets empty just sits there, nobody does anything, but here and there someone pays them three months of rent so that they can approach, uh, so that they can, yeah, take advantage of the acorns between November and usually March to fatten some pigs. But it's a short-term thing and it's just for that and nothing is being done to the land. So it's again loss-loss, but some always do benefit. So in that case, it's those who make the hem. And there are two players here, I can tell the names because they're very big. So one is a cooperative called COVAP. The letters stand for um, Cooperativa del Valle de los Pedroches, and that's the biggest player and uh, usually um, yeah, they, they are the one that developed over all the time and they have gotten some competition recently. Um, well, recently, over the last few years. Um, and the competition is Beoterra. It's uh, a company that created um, yeah, a ripening chamber, a pretty big one. They sit in nearby Anyora and they focus on the hem. Both of them export hem and apparently a lot of the hem goes to China, as one can read. The thing about Bayotera is they have built, yeah, let's call it some sort of a kafu, but it's not for pigs to live in there, it's only the sows, and they have space for 1,500 sows, and the piglets will be raised inside of that structure on commercial feed, and when they are old enough, they will then be brought to farms that are empty and have some acorns for those three months. And then they get collected and they go to the slaughterhouse and then that what interests them happens. So it's now all about the hem and the meat is sold off because it's not so interesting, but the hem is where the money is. So that is what happens when people give up. And of course, we don't want to do the very same thing. We are here for the restoration of the soil, but this is context, which is why I have been mentioned this. And there is no local market because people here 
either eat chicken or pig. Of course, um, in an area like this where the Iberico is at home, of course, that is what people eat. And on a Friday, actually, they do eat fish for a different reason, which comes frozen from the coast. And the red meat from bovines, this is not what a lot of people are looking for. Here and there, but it's not really interesting. In the northern part of Spain, that is totally different, it's just the opposite. They don't eat pig, they eat meat from cattle, yeah? beef. So that means local market doesn't really exist. And if you wanted to sell it to elsewhere, then of course it's a question makes, does it make sense? So does it make sense in our situation where we are struggling with the forage to try to sell to, for example, the German market grass-fed beef? Sure, a few would buy it, but more in order to help us. But it's not really very interesting financially. And finances are important because you don't get to do things if you don't have the funds. Of course, you can go for donations and try it that way, but it's better to have a viable and a sustainable business in the long term. So there are a lot of things that can be done with some donations, but it's always a little bit more complicated and more risky than just to create a working business. So now the next thing is we are not allowed to slaughter any animal here on site. If we would do this, then Guardia Civil would come, would confiscate everything and we would be punished with a huge fine. So in order to be allowed to do this, we need to build a slaughterhouse. And there is the small one for poultry and also for rabbits. And then there is the other one, and the other one is a lot more complicated because you basically have to convince the authorities that they will give you the permit. And of course they will believe that you want to build a slaughterhouse for a lot of animals every day. And of course they don't want this in any place. And of course there might be other considerations in the background. Plus they are a lot, uh, they, they are afraid and a lot um, about the waste. So everything that is not edible is considered a waste. And of course, in regenerative agriculture, we have ways to make use of this material. It has value for us. For example, the rumen and the intestines and all this, this can be brought out so that insects lay their eggs in there, flies, yeah, the black soldier fly, for example. And then this is food, the larvae that come out of that, for chicken. So there is no waste and the material gets used. But the authorities, they don't think about that. They think about that you will just throw it somewhere yeah, away and then it rots there and it creates issues, health issues. And of course they want to avoid this. So they won't give you the permit easily unless you educate and explain and uh, it's a long-term game. So we cannot do this. We are allowed because we are in Andalusia to slaughter a few pigs but we cannot sell their meat. So it's only for the consumption of us. And depending how you interpret that, it means the family, not friends and family. So there might even be a restriction that we cannot give the meat to our workers because they are not family. And this might be considered a sale. And then we always, yeah, again, we have a legal problem. So because we cannot slaughter, we cannot control the value chain from the beginning to the end. So direct marketing of grass-fed beef is much harder because we need to truck our cattle and it might just be one because of course we want to sell it first and then slaughter the animal instead of filling the market. Direct sales works based on demand so that means existing orders and not you put it out there and hope that someone within the time the meat is good, we'll pick it up. So you do the other way around. And that means we have to transport one, one animal to a slaughterhouse. The truck is the same, regardless whether it's one or 20. So the cost is huge. 
And then after the slaughter, of course, we have the carcass. And now the carcass needs to be transported back in a refrigerated transport to the butcher shop to do the processes. And then we can ship it. So it's pretty complicated and it requires two times the transport over a longer distance. So a longer distance means between one or two hours in a truck because the slaughterhouse that Kovap operates is off limits for us. We would have to be a member, a, a shareholder of Kovap, and then we have to play by their rules and basically be their supplier. So that is cut off. So we cannot use this. So that means no slaughterhouse, no slaughter on site. You cannot take a rifle much less and just to uh, shoot the animal where it stands, which would be the best way. Also, the European Union does recommend this. Uh, there is a lot of movement going on in order to make this the norm. So in Germany, for example, people talk about mobile slaughter, which is basically the animal gets killed on the field where it stands, and then the dead animal is transported to the butcher shop. Or, this is one variety of this, or the other is the, the truck comes with all the installations, but this is for smaller ruminants, like sheep or goats, and not for the big ones. But at least there is consideration and there's movement, and people have been talking to the authorities in different places, but of course the local culture and the perception and politics play into this, whether this is something that is now permitted all over the place or only in a few areas. So, I definitely want to pursue this, but it is difficult, it takes a long time, and it costs money, and all the while we have to feed the animals, and maybe there is a different way, and I think there is, so don't forget, this is about why we are removing them, so I'm not talking about the benefit of having them that we have seen, but the challenges. And then there comes the biggest part, and this is uh, a very sad one. So, as you saw in a video um, that aired a little bit earlier, again, we have six cases now of tuberculosis. They are still in that herd. They will um, be removed next week when all the paperwork for removing them has been done. See, there's always the thing with the paperwork. So. It's a contagious disease, they have been diagnosed by this tuberculin test and now it took a long time to get everything sorted out and maybe next week, probably on Tuesday, today is Saturday, um, this can be done. Um, and then we will see what happens next, but this is an issue. So um, only cattle are being tested for tuberculosis. And if you have a positive case, then you get an order by the authority to sacrifice the animal. And that is the way to control this um, contagious disease. Now the problem is, humans and every other animal can also be a carrier of tuberculosis. It's a bacteria, and it gets shared by saliva, or by sharing um, a water place, or whatever. Or even the breath could carry that bacteria. So it's a huge issue. And as we learned from the father of the veterinarian who was here to do the tuberculosis tests, um, he on the farm he manages had tuberculosis cases that cost them 50 head of cattle because of pigs. And pigs are not tested. So they picked it up somewhere else, were then brought there for the, um, yeah, for the acorn season and they munched on grasses and other things, and the cattle then also munched on the very same things, and boom, the tuberculosis spread from the pigs to the cattle. The cattle is tested, you get a sacrifice order, bad luck. So that also means that any goat, sheep, horses, donkeys, poultry, whatever, all them, yeah, all these can have tuberculosis but none is tested, at least not here. So I repeat, only cattle is being tested. So of course, 
not knowing about something does not mean that it does not exist. It does exist. Also, you have no record about it or you refuse to get proof. But it does exist. It is around. But thinking about the economical part, if every year or every six months you lose a few head of cattle, then of course um, the effect, the positive effect of having a herd of cattle uh, gets nullified. So this does not work. So there's another reason why it seems smarter to not work with cattle in our case. Management is easier without them. Feed can be managed in a different way and it is less because a 500 kilo cow needs about 10% of forage every day, ideally, so that's 50 kilo and uh, right now I don't see the 50 kilo. Um, while the temperatures were better and there was rain, so the other years before, that seemed viable. But right now I see more issues and more problems. So all that taken into account, cattle in our case is more an issue. Of course there is one thing that I should mention what we could do. We could be very strict in our paddocks and then define a place like the one where the pigs are right now as a sacrifice paddock and deliberately destroy it and put a lot of straw there and feed them on alfalfa pellets. Those a little bit more than 10,000 euro. And then of course this area will improve just because there is a lot of biomass, but there's the money. So if the money were not an issue, maybe that's an idea. You cannot park cattle. An innovative idea, if everybody here would bond together and maintain one herd, that gets moved around, yeah, that would be a solution. But people don't want to do this, and there is laws that prevent this. So, in the end, it's not a solution. So, we are going to remove the cattle, and this is going to be a multi-step process. So, next week, the six that have been deemed tuberculosis positive will go, plus the remaining bull will go and then we have only cows that are adult cows and we did a check most of them except two seem to be pregnant so we are expecting a lot of calf soon and then the calves that we have which is 18 animals 10 of them are little bulls and we are going to castrate them just to make them a little bit more docile and make the management a little bit easier. We don't want to have bulls fighting over rank in the time they need to grow into adults. So the problem gets worse every month that they develop. You know, they are now 11 months old. So we castrate them just to mitigate this. So they already got an appointment with the vet who will come here and do this. And then, of course, the new ones that will arrive soon when the cows um, will give birth. Um, we will also check if it's a bull. And in the case it is a bull, then we will do the same. Uh, we don't want to sell calves. Makes no sense. Um, we rather do the effort and feed them until they are old enough. So the target is at least three years. And then they will be gone also. So, as you can see, you can also go to Gamite AU and have a look at our inventory that I'm showing there. It comes directly from the very same system we used for internal purposes to manage everything. So this is live and actual data. So there you can see who is who. And, like I said, they will be removed as soon as it's sensible to do so. We don't want to do any crazy thing and much less uh, a very questionable action like slaughtering a pregnant cow. I don't want to do this. So that is something that makes no sense and it's just cruel and bad and why? No? There is no reason. So let's not do this. So we wait until they are adults and then step by step they will be removed while we build up, next segment, the poultry part. And 
I will talk about the poultry part in a second installment and probably in a follow-up video. So I have a feeling because I ramble a lot that this will be a multi-part um, series to explain this huge change. So I think that should be it for today. So now you know why we are removing the cattle and I will share more ideas about the poultry idea then in the next part. So, see you then.